for this invitation. On behalf of my Secretary General, we are very um, happy to be here. And um, we do um, appreciate very much the project which was uh, presented to us this morning. And we do look forward to uh, uh, work with you. And we hope to give you uh, food for thought. And we may uh, start. <laughs> I'm sure we will. The title, the, I was asked to make, um, at least as I understood, uh, a comparison between the 1970 Convention and the 1995 Unidroit know, Convention. I thank Professor Nafsinger very much because many things will not be repeated. I will just uh, go quickly through them. I took the liberty to add to uh, the title of the presentation and an inspiration for the 2014 directive. I, was, I started by writing an inspiration for the EU directives because even though the 1993 directive is chronologically preceding the convention, it was drafting on the basis of the draft UNIDRA convention. It's obvious and everybody who uh, attended the meetings for the preparation of the directive know it. And I'm happy to have here in the room um, I was at UNIDRA when the convention was negotiated, it's true, but we have in the room at least three persons who did uh, actively attend and negotiated the convention, um, including the representative of Poland. Um, of course, the starting point will be the 1970 uh, UNESCO convention, because as Professor Naftikos said, it is the first time in for, uh, uh, in time of peace, that a convention gave really the basis and it was the first time that cultural property deserved a specific treatment. Um, quite early, UNESCO um, was aware of some weaknesses of the convention, in particular on the restitution provisions, because as you know, the 1970 convention, and I'm also talking under the control of my friend here present, the representative of UNESCO, the UNESCO Venice office. Um, this convention has, let's say, three pillars, prevention, restitution, and cooperation. Restitution provisions are very, very small, and they are weak, and this is why um, we'll see that UNRWA came in. The, one of the weakness, which could be a strength, of the convention is the fact that it needs national implementation. And Professor Naftika explained to us that it is not a uniform, unified or harmonized implementation. And even some of the 131 uh, state parties have no national implementing legislation, which means that they do not or cannot apply the convention, even though they are party to, to it. Um, of course, the 1970 Convention is not the only um, instrument to protect cultural property. Um, within the UNESCO conventions, you see there are many um, here and in last December at UNESCO, it was decided to work more on the synergies between the conventions because we do have many instruments, uh, let's say sometimes overlapping, so we do need to know them well, how they work and how they can be used together. Of course, apart the UNESCO conventions, uh, in this field we also have, uh, for a U EU uh, member states, UK, we have the Commonwealth scheme, which seemed to uh, be a dead letter. We don't hear about it uh, a lot, but it still exists. Uh, we also have the Council of Europe, and you may know that the Council of Europe is starting soon to work on a new instrument. They talk about revitalizing the 1983 Convention on Criminal Offenses, which never entered into force. But so they will start later this year uh, one more instrument. In 1983, a committee was uh, set up at the request of the UNESCO Executive Board because of the weaknesses of this convention, and in particular some countries already starting to say that archaeological objects were not well treated, dealt with, with the convention. But this committee 
did not intend to revise the convention, uh, also because already 50 states were party to it, and that several important countries uh, were about to. So um, they just said, we need to have more information on illicit traffic. And they decided to um, ask UNESCO to cooperate with UNIDROIT on private law aspects, such as the good faith acquisition in particular. Um, these are the seven uh, recommendations made, six to member states and one to the Secretariat. Two, uh, the one to the Secretariat is to uh, work with UNIDROIT. And this was done on the basis of a draft uniform law on the acquisition good faith of corporate movables, which was adopted in 1975 at UNIDROIT, but which never became, not at all, on cultural uh, heritage, which uh, was never uh, transformed into um, a convention. Two thousand and fifteen, twenty years uh, anniversary of the UNIDROIT convention. We had a very interesting conference in Rome last May, and several uh, of you were did attend the conference. Uh, this means that a lot of time passed by. And we'll see that a lot happened uh, within those 20 years um, on, the, uh, on the subject. To compare the two conventions, we have to um, talk, as Professor Naftika said, and we all, we have to remedy weaknesses of one convention and also build on strength, which is uh, what very important for Union Roy because we didn't start from scratch. We did have the 1970 convention to work on and also 25 years of study of the phenomenon, which uh, was quite helpful. Of course, the two conventions were drafted, at least the 1995 was drafted to be totally uh, compatible and complementary to uh, the 1970 convention and as an multilateral instrument with more than 80 countries negotiating, it needed to be a compromise. The main weaknesses, we believe, of the 1970 convention were dealt with, if not solved. I would say solved, but some member states would not say so, uh, by the UNIDROIT convention, and we, we will see how uh, it worked. First of all, the scope of the uh, convention. As Professor Vnatica said, uh, the, the uh, 1970 convention was criticized because of its drafting, which was quite large, and uh, it could um, lead to different interpretation. This was not the case with the UNIDROIT convention. Uh, the drafters were very keen to have a very strict drafting which, of course, in terms of ratification, has its cost because there's no interpretation possible and there's no choice. We'll see no reservations as it is possible with the 1970 uh, Convention. Also, and we'll see uh, that no need of um, implementing legislation. Still for the scope of the Convention, in the Unified Convention on Stolen Object, the uh, principle is beyond any ambiguity. The possessor of a stolen object shall return it. So there's absolutely no possibility of interpretation. And for the illegally exported objects, the, um, uh, it's, it, it's the, there are classes, it's a limitation in the objects covered, which is certainly uh, narrower that uh, the imp of, of, um, if we compare it with the broad interpretation which some states have given to Article 3 of the 1970 Convention, but it is much wider than the object covered under Article 7 and 9 of the Convention. Some, and the United States, for example, uh, is implementing the 1970 Convention on the basis of those two um, articles, which is an advance in practice. 
then you'll have the definition of cultural property. The two conventions have the same um, definition. They are presented differently, but uh, they are the same uh, definition. There is, though, an important difference. It is that the UNESCO is a government action, so only governments can act. Under the UNESCO Convention, uh, there's no need for the objects to be specifically designated by the state to be protected by the convention. So we have many more objects covered by the convention, in particular for the uh, in case of theft, and uh, in particular all those even which could may not be known by the state. Who can claim under the UNESCO Convention only states can claim for the return of an object through diplomatic offices? Under the UNIDROIT, a private owner can claim directly in a foreign court for the restitution. And a state can do it for illegal export because, of course, it's done on the basis of a breach of its uh, legislation. So it is uh, quite larger and we will see that uh, also at the EU level, such uh, uh, provision exists now since a regulation dating back 2012. Some notions were not dealt with in the 1970 Convention. One of those is the time limitation of, of claims. There are no rules. Uh, some um, academic uh, say that uh, under the 1970 Convention, there are no time limitation. I would say that under the 1954, in time of war, it's more accepted that there might not be any time limitation. In this, um, if for the 1970 Convention, it would be more the national, uh, if any, uh, rules which will apply. UNIDROIT tackled this issue. It was quite difficult and long. But we do have um, time limitations for stolen objects. Professor Navtika read uh, before the text. Uh, and it is, uh, I must say, for stolen objects or, or for uh, the same, and we'll see this with the EU later, and the, state, the same starting points too. Another notion which is not solved in the 1970 Convention, compensation and due diligence. The terms just compensation, innocent purchaser, indemnity, holders in good faith do appear or did appear in UNESCO conventions before 1954 and 1970, but with no criteria, no definition, um, and uh, it was uh, then referred to national legislation. Uh, and we know how the protection of the innocent purchaser varies between states. With the UNIDROIT Convention, um, there is a possibility for compensation, but it's strictly limited to those who ex exercise due diligence when acquiring the uh, objects. And the Convention does give criteria. Uh, we will see how similar they are to those in the uh, directive. Clandestine excavations, um, it's uh, something which were not, was not covered by the 1970 Convention. Uh, as you remember, you know that for an object to be returned, it has to be on a museum, on the inventory of the museums. Archaeological objects uh, of clandestine excavation are not in museums, they are obviously not inventoried, so they are not returned, strictly speaking, under the 1970 Convention, unless a state wishes to be more generous, of course. Um, in the UNDRA Convention, we do have specific provisions to protect more archaeological objects, for example, the, an object which is illicitly excavated is considered as stolen if it was excavated in a country where there is a state ownership of the subsoil. And Professor Naftiger also told you about the model provisions we drafted with UNESCO 
to help countries to have a good such legislation. There are no time limitation to action for archaeological objects under the convention, except specific declaration by states. And for illegal objects, we do also have specific provisions for archaeological objects. Neither the 1970 convention nor the 1995 convention, as all international conventions, they are not retroactive. But if the 1970 convention doesn't say anything about retroactivity, the Unidroit Convention does say that um, there are other means to uh, claim for the return of objects which uh, were taken before the entry into force of the convention. One of these uh, means is the um, ICPRCP, the Intergovernmental Committee at UNESCO with the long name. Um, and the UNRWA Convention specifically uh, indicates that prior wrongful acts are not legitimized. It's not because the convention is not retroactive that you forget what happened before. You just have to look for other means to claim them uh, back. Another difference between the two instruments, which I mentioned uh, quickly before, is the uh, if you need an implementing legislation under the 1970 convention, the Unidroit Convention is self-executing. You do not need to have a transposition law. You do need to have a national legislation, in particular uh, prohibition for export. You do have to uh, provide for a private person to claim an object on a foreign court, but uh, there's nothing really specific uh, to this. Now, uh, since the adoption of the Convention, we are building on strength. Uh, and UNESCO and UNIDROIT, also with other uh, organizations, we uh, keep on having a strong partnership. partnership. Uh, and I must say also, with the current situation, with the Council Resolution 2199 uh, on um, making the link between terrorism and uh, illicit traffic in cultural property and financing of terrorism, UNIDROIT is one of the uh, organization working with UNESCO and Interpol called by the Council of uh, Security. Um, there I can be quite quick. Um, the two conventions are what maybe professor would call a, a legal platform more than a base for international cooperation. Uh, we did work a lot to have those convention. It was very difficult because we were really starting from quite radical positions. Um, the fact that uh, market states started to be quite, uh, the, also the victims, and in particular private persons, made market st uh, states more ready to negotiate and find solutions. But it was not easy and uh, uh, we, we managed. Of course, uh, states can go even further than the convention. The UNRWA convention, uh, it is written in the text that it just sets a common, minimum common rules. Uh, bilateral uh, agreements are a mean to go even further or uh, deeper in the um, action taken. Those two conventions have a positive effect on public attitude. Uh, the legal trade is now, you find it in, um, uh, in the media. Uh, a lot of academic writing, you see the project you are starting now, uh, would not have started many years uh, ago. The practice of museums also is, uh, has changed with the adoption of code of ethics. Um, and uh, the 1970 has become a threshold uh, what happened before, you could, you don't really care. After 1970, you have to be careful, even if, of course, it's just um, a date, but uh, the date will depend on the entry into force of, uh, the, um, for the, of the convention for the country. 
it's also, um, they also had uh, um, effects on countries and on the way they tackle the problem. We, uh, there is also pressure on the art market and dealers, which is very important. And uh, next week in Paris, there will be the first big conference uh, between, uh, with the art market. Uh, it will be one of the first time where there will be really discussion between the two worlds, as themselves they do need to be very careful uh, when they when they uh, buy and when they sell. Uh, many uh, tools have been drafted since the adoption of the two conventions to help countries to better implement the two uh, conventions, because of course we do need, it's a multidisciplinary exercise. We cannot, nobody can do it on its own, we do need to work all uh, together. This, very quickly, um, the new statutory uh, organs of the 1970 Convention, um, s which uh, were adopted in 2012 uh, and met since 2013, are very important. Um, meeting of state parties, they will now meet every two years, and the subsidiary committee will meet, is meeting every year. It will meet next September in Paris, and I'm talking about this because in the new uh, composition of the subsidiary committee, Poland is a newcomer. So it will be an opportunity for Poland to discuss this convention uh, together with the 1995 convention because it is, they, are, they are always linked in uh, the d discussions. Uh, there is also a follow-up committee under the Unidroi Convention. Um, we, it may meet also uh, this year, we will, we will see. The, I will conclude by the influence the two conventions have had on other instruments. Uh, the model provisions I uh, mentioned before, databases, the Interpol database on stolen object was created in 1995 after the adoption of the convention. The UNESCO database on legal, on uh, cultural legislation, also on other conventions, as Professor Naptika uh, explained, the, uh, in particular the underwater uh, convention, and the influence at regional level. And here I finish with my two or three last slides, which uh, is the directive. This is the regulation 2012 I was talking to you, I was telling you before, um, enabling uh, an owner to uh, initiate proceedings as regard a civil claim in the court of the place of situation of the object. Uh, it entered into force last uh, year, but it was already in the UNIDRA Convention 20 years ago. The recast of the European Directive, as uh, we heard, uh, the ratification uh, of the UNRWA Convention was one of the options which then was abandoned. But the Commission, in its impact analysis, said that if all EU countries were party to the UNRWA Convention, there would be no need to revise the directive because they would have a better protection. But this was not feasible for the time being, so uh, they needed to recast the, uh, convention, the directive. These are the countries of the EU parties to uh, the 1970 and the Unidroi Convention. I put France and Netherlands in uh, bold with the star because they are signatory to the Unidroi Convention, but they have not yet ratified it. Three countries are still missing for the two conventions, Ireland, Latvia and uh, Malta. But uh, I can say that no EU, some are working. Uh, I know that some uh, EU member is working at the ratification and one is, I hope, about to. Uh, but we are waiting uh, for, in the next weeks uh, or month, you never know how it goes, for uh, six or seven states to ratify the convention. Uh, Ghana, Laos, South Africa, uh, Morocco, Tunisia. They all have completed their um, procedures for the ratification. And the most, I will not go back on the most relevant changing, changes in the recast of the European Directive, 
uh, it has been done before me, just to say that the three were already taken in the convention because the time limit for initiating was already three years in the convention, the burden of proof and the criteria. And this is to show you the text, the criteria for due diligence of the directive on your left, the model on the right. Uh, interestingly enough, the EU decided to call it due care and attention and not due diligence. Um, and what was added is the uh, documents, the authorization for the removal, because I recall that under the directive we're only talking about illegally exported object. The text on your right appears under chapter two, which deals with stolen object. And finally, the UNOI Convention has a deconnection clause, which means that uh, states from uh, a regional economic integration organization having rules between themselves on the same matters at the convention may, with a declaration, declare that they will, uh, between themselves, apply the directive, in this case, and not the convention. And this is maybe the first thought, uh, food for thought, that I give you. Uh, there's an error in the text, because only Six states parties to the convention have made such a declaration and will therefore apply the directive for illegally exported object. But my question was, what about the other six? Uh, I put seven because the Netherlands, while uh, at the time of signature, made such a declaration, but it's not a state party. So six have done that. But so what will happen for the EU countries which have not made this uh, declaration uh, in case of uh, uh, a claim for return, will they use the convention or uh, the uh, directive? And I thank you very much.